In the 2000s, the CIA silently released a bulk of documents on the military Stargate project. Amongst them is a very strange document titled Mars Exploration, May 22, 1984, that can be found in the CIA archives online. In this document, there is a transcript of the session in which an intelligence service officer worked with an unnamed individual using remote viewing techniques to observe Mars, and whether or not we can believe it. This document is one of the most strange things to come out of the official Stargate project. Stargate was a secret U.S. Army unit funded by the Congress and created to investigate whether psychic phenomena had any military use. The project was terminated and declassified in 1995 after the CIA decided results were too inconsistent for intelligence applications. The program proved to be successful during 17 years of its existence, and the project's findings are worth exploring though. Stargate mainly focused on remote viewing, which is the purported ability to psychically see events, sites, or information, even if the viewer was in a distant place or time. We were an, just another collection methodology, and so when we provided our intelligence, it was included just like any other intelligence methodology. Remote viewing has been demonstrated in many labs in many countries by many different researchers uh, using different kinds of remote viewing protocols. So remote viewing is a, uh, a replicable example of psi. Joe McMonigle writes that he predicted the location and existence of the Soviet Typhoon-class submarine in 79, and that in mid-January 1980, satellite photos confirmed those predictions. He says the military remote viewing program was ended partly due to stigma. Everybody wanted to use it, but nobody wanted to be caught dead standing next to it. There's an automatic ridicule factor. Apart from mundane espionage targets of the Cold War era, more extreme viewing targets were given from time to time, which brings us to the truly bizarre exploration of Mars in 1984. We might be talking more than a million years, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, if there were structures on Mars at one time. And that's a whole new science of archaeology that we don't know very much about. So when you have, quote, professional archaeologists look at these satellite images and say, no, that's not anything important, they don't have a lot of basis. They haven't looked at lots of planets with ancient civilizations on them to school them in this. They are limited in their knowledge. So how are we going to maybe get a look at this? Well, what, let's try remote viewing. An analyst in a document is an unnamed person. But most likely it was Joe McMonagall, the analyst who was known as Remote Viewer 001 at Project Stargate. He was given a sealed envelope and a separate set of geographical coordinates from another unnamed individual known as the Monitor. As was revealed in the later presentation, the Monitor was Captain F. Holmes Skip Atwater who was the founder of the U.S. Army's remote viewing unit. Dr. Putoff gave me these lists of coordinates on the planet Mars and said, you might like to try this at some time. Well, Joe didn't know I had this list. I haven't, had never looked at it before, but he was a very good remote viewer, done lots of different military missions for us. And the way I decided to get him on the target was to simply take a three by five card and write on the three by five card the planet Mars, one million years BC. I took that three by five card, put it inside a little sealed envelope. According to the declassified transcript, the envelope was not opened by the analyst, performing the remote viewing session in somewhat we would describe as an altered state of consciousness. Joe began describing what he saw. So it looks like a, well, so it's a kind of a bleak view of a. Uh, Pyramid, a pyramidal form. Mm, it's very high. Uh, it's sitting in a large depressed area. Mm -hmm. It's yellowish, uh, ochre colored. Then Atwater asked to move him in time to the time indicated in the envelope. The impression of severe, severe clouds, more like dust storm, uh, geologic problems. Like a, uh, from what I are, and it sounds a little weird. I'm 
looking at an after effect from a major geologic problem. The monitor then asks the analyst to look around for any activity before a geological problem. You're saying uh, it's like a perception of a shadow of people. Very tall, dead. It's only a shadow. It's as if they were there and they're not, not there anymore. The analyst then is trying to go further back to a period of time when they were there, but complains of what is only described as static. I'm seeing very large people. They appear thin and tall, but they're very large, uh, wearing some kind of strange clothes. We might just pause here for a little to remind you this is an official CIA document that you can download and read in the CIA online reading room. Then Joe continues on some different coordinates. Quote, deep inside of a cavern, more like a canyon, I'm looking up, up the sides of a steep wall that seemed to go on forever. And there's like a structure. It's like the wall of the canyon itself has been carved. Again, I'm getting a very large structures, no intricacies, huge sections of smooth stone. He explains the structures have very high wide rooms inside them. Then there is a 22 minutes pause in the transcript, and then it resumes at new coordinates, where there is something that you wouldn't expect. Quote, they have a, appears to be the end of a very large road, and there's a marker thing that's very large. Keep getting Washington Monument overlay. It's like an obelisk. This concept of overlays comes up several times in the transcript. Based on how it is used, it seems like images from the remote viewer's memory can sometimes overlay objects in the vision if they are similar enough. The monitor then gives the remote viewer complete freedom to choose areas he finds interesting, and he begins describing pyramids designed to be, quote, filtered from storms. They're like shelters from storms. The first target when I got the coordinate was a pyramid, but it was a very bizarre pyramid. It seemed to be much larger, and it had funny rooms in it that were different from pyramids I understood. I commented that I believe this pyramid must be a new discovery, because it was different. I went from target to target, and as I was doing these targets, I was getting an impression of great age, very ancient targets. He has to go inside of one of these pyramids and find some activities to tell about. In 37 minutes, he continues, quote, different chambers, but they're almost stripped of any kind of furnishings or anything. It's like a strictly functional place for sleeping, or that's not a good word, hibernations, some form, I can't. I get real raw inputs, storms, savage storm, and sleeping through storms. The monitor then asks, tell me about the ones who sleep through the storms. Quote, very tall again, very large people, but they're thin. They look thin because of their height. And they dress like in, it's like a real light silk, but it's not flowing type of clothing. It's like cut to fit. Then Atwater asked Joe to move close to one of them. The story goes on in this particular situation of actually getting in some sort of perhaps telepathic connection with one of these individuals and having that individual then explain to Joe what happened. He continues, quote, they're ancient people. They're, uh, they're dying. It's past their time or age. They're very philosophic about it. They're just looking for a way to survive and they just can't. It seems that these beings uh, knew that there was going to be some sort of catastrophic event and attempted to create or design some sort of suspended animation, protective place, so that they, their species might survive this cataclysm. Joe continues the session in 40 minutes. Quote, can't seem to get their way out. They can't seem to find their way out. So they're hanging on while they look or wait for something to return or something coming with the answer. When pressed on who might return, he continues, quote, evidently was a group or a part of them that went to find a new place to live. 
The analyst then explains what he sees when focusing on what caused the environment disturbance. When I asked Joe to describe this, um, under the idea of thinking in my head, is this, was this like a nuclear war or something? And I didn't suggest that to him. He said, no, this is the result of some cosmic event, as though the planet was struck by a comet or a meteor which ripped its atmosphere off and destroyed everything. Now, we don't know time-wise when this is because we got lost in time in the remote viewing. Then the monitor asks the analyst to continue to communicate with an individual and ask him if he knows who he is and is there any help he can provide him in his predicament. Joe answered, quote, All I get is that they must just wait. Doesn't know who I am. Think he perceives I'm a hallucination or something. The monitor then asks how the others left Mars to find a new place to live. Apparently some of them left the planet. And I say apparently because Joe doesn't know he's on Mars, but he says there's some people that go away in some sort of a um, curved object that reminded him of a boat and they went to someplace else to try to uh, avoid this cataclysm. The monitor then tells him to go with them on their journey to find out where they go. The analyst then answered with this, quote, impression of a really crazy place with volcanoes and gas pockets and strange plants. Very volatile place. It's very much like going from the frying pan into the fire. Difference is, there seems to be a lot of vegetation where the other place did not have it, and different kind of storm. And this is where the transcript and the document ended. Maybe it's a lot to process, and perhaps we can't verify words from a remote viewer just yet. But there was a reason why the attention of researchers was attracted to these coordinates in the first place. I should tell you a little bit where the target package came from. Um, I befriended Dr. Putoff out at SRI, and he eventually shared uh, information with me that the scientists in another section of SRI had come up with and identified interesting anomalies on the planet Mars, um, things that look like remnants of structures, square angles, that supposedly nature doesn't make a lot of square angles, in rows like they might have been buildings or structures, several pyramid type shaped things, uh, lines, parallel lines in the road, in um, the dirt, like roads are parallel lines. Things that we would not expect to see. And there's lots of argument back and forth about whether these are artificial structures or not. There were a few papers that proved the theoretical possibility for complex life to evolve on Mars. Another study from the Berkeley University shows asteroid impacts during a period known as the Late Heavy Bombardment, about four billion years ago heated Mars's mantle. Could that have been the catastrophic cosmic event the analyst was vaguely referring to? But the most exciting experiment was done by NASA in 1976. The Viking lander on Mars found something that still remains unexplained. After being injected with nutrients, Martian soil samples expelled signature radioactive gas, just like soils from Earth. Was this signal a natural phenomenon, or the proof that Mars was habitable once, and this is our first encounter with an alien biology? Hopefully, humanity will establish a permanent mission on Mars soon enough that could provide more detailed verification of the information reported in this declassified CIA document. And if all of this is true, what does it say about our perceptual ability and our consciousness? Here Joe McMonagall presumably was able to perceive millions of miles across space and perhaps millions of years across time. What does that perceptual ability say about who we are if Joe is a model of the human evolving consciousness, who are we really?